This Batman story is one of the best Batman stories I've ever read. Most stories I really get drawn to are the ones that feel otherworldly, dark, and with a bit of levity by the end. And this story that I've been wanting to cover for some time is just that. This story puts you in a place where you know absolutely nothing except that Bruce Wayne is Batman. Or so you're led to believe. Because throughout the story, you're not sure if Batman is even a real thing or if Bruce Wayne has just been insane the entire time. Everything as you know it about the DC Universe has been flipped upside down completely, and it's your job, the reader, and Bruce Wayne to figure out why this happened. This story has many different twists and turns, and it's such a doozy. So, let's get into it. This story opens with a hardened Batman following a case for the better part of a year, where all over Gotham, someone has left chalk lines to outline the Batman's dead body, and where Batman's heart is marked, lies Crime Alley, the place where everything started. Upon Bruce entering Crime Alley, he finds a small boy with an umbrella with the atmosphere feeling too quiet. Batman then slowly approaches the boy only to find a long dead corpse. Further investigating, Batman phones into Jim Gordon informing him of the body, but while doing so, the corpse lifts its arm, revealing a gun. And before Batman can even react, he is seemingly shot. <laughs> Come in. Anyone here? You're here. Bruce Wayne. My lord, you're right here. And it's finally over. You. What have you done to me? Take it easy, Bruce. Please. Your motor functions, your speech, they'll all come back soon. It's a simple side effect. Just relax. No, oh, you're tricking me. Playing a joke. But I'm not. In fact, this is the first time in many years you're not being tricked, Bruce. See, we tried everything to get through to you. All kinds of therapeutic measures. Nothing ever worked. But now, finally, a new medicine created by your family's pharma branch, a drug called Heliox, has done its job. And so after all this time, you're actually here with us, in reality. And at this facility, we're just so happy to meet no, you. No, 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 no. I know who you are. I know you. I know you too, Bruce. I'm your doctor, Dr. Redmond Hood. And I have been for nearly 20 years, the whole time you've been here with us, in Arkham Asylum. Dr. Hood further explaining Bruce's situation, Bruce refuses to listen, begging to be released. Upon further struggle, Dr. Hood shows Alfred into Bruce's room. And Alfred meaning Bruce, he's joyful that Bruce has finally come to and can finally come home soon, telling Bruce that no one blames him for what happened. But Bruce confusingly asks what Alfred means, and Alfred begrudgingly says that Bruce killed his parents 20 years ago. He had hoped they were all on the same page at this point. Bruce starts to freak out until Alfred ragefully unveils a curtain showing several different patients and workers around the asylum that share resemblances to his villains, saying to Bruce that he's been living in this fantasy called Batman for too long and that it's affected other people's lives, saying that Bruce needs to face the reality of the situation, and until he does, he won't be leaving. Later, Bruce wakes up in his padded cell and desperately tries to find something anything to break himself out. While searching for a tear or a hole, he finds one, and upon searching through it, he finds the iconic Penny and Dinosaur from the Batcave. Furious, he screams that he won't give in and that he knows that this is all some sick game. The next day, Alfred meets with him again to discuss everything, leading Bruce to ask questions like how he learned to do so many things, like speaking different languages, fighting styles, and so on, to which Alfred has an explanation for everything, like that he learned how to fight from a gymnast called Dr. Algul referencing Rachel Ghoul, and he learned many languages from the librarian, Elliot, 
referencing Hush. After Alfred explains these things to Bruce, Alfred decides that Bruce needs to see his cowl for his own eyes. Upon giving him the cowl, he explains that it was a sort of shock therapy treatment for Bruce, with Alfred saying to Bruce that the sooner he accepts this, the sooner they can go home together. However, Bruce has a different idea. Putting on the cowl, attempting to escape, climbing each floor in the asylum, and taking out whoever tries to stop him, while equipping himself with several different tools from workers or guards. However, Bruce ends up cornered at the very top of the asylum, until Alfred calls them all off and to leave them. Bruce demands to know what is going on because he knows that this is all a trick, to which Alfred begins to tell him that there's nothing left for him outside of this place. The world isn't the same as it was meaning there's no more mission for Batman. And while Alfred speaks to Bruce, he asks to see his true face after feeling that his heartbeat was different, with Alfred shutting down his face tech to reveal he is much, much older. It's also here where Alfred explains that he isn't the original Bruce Wayne, but a copy, and that he wasn't even supposed to wake up for another two years. Alfred then tries to ask Bruce to stay in the simulation with him, telling Bruce that he had Toy Man code an entire Gotham City that matched the original perfectly, practically begging Bruce to stay and give it a chance. But Bruce refuses, and with Alfred realizing that his son won't budge, he gives him the penny to remember him, and one final hug with the boy he loves. Later, Bruce bursts out of a sand dune, climbing out to a dry, sun-scorched desert. Upon walking out further, he'd find a lantern covered in sand, wiping it off, only to find it filled with the Joker's head. With Joker then waking up screaming, who's there? Batman tries to ask Joker how in the hell he ended up this way, but the Joker being crazy, he doesn't remember a thing. But it's cut short as a speedstorm arrives, in which if you're caught inside of it, you could age to death. With that, Batman carries his head on his side, and the two press forward to find any semblance of life. Over time, Batman and Joker find themselves in what once was Coast City, only to find a wasteland. The Joker would tell Batman that the Green Lanterns had been wiped out after an attack by Brainiac, and the last lantern, Mogo, went out swinging. Afterwards, Green Lantern rings fell like rain and leached onto the closest people possible. But while explaining, huge green babies start chasing Batman, and behind them are normal people being dragged. This is because it takes an immense amount of willpower to control a ring. Thus, if there is lack of will, the user would not be able to control the projections. Batman manages to maneuver around these projections enough where others come to the rescue, with bullets piercing through the projections. And out of a tank, Vixen pulls Batman inside. Vixen is then in disbelief on whether or not she's looking at the real Batman, so she asks Poison Ivy, and upon her looking at him, she uses a vine to knock him out. Later, Bruce wakes in a cave, bonded by a form of crystal, and atop of him are Vixen, Donna Troy, Supergirl, and Poison Ivy standing guard. That is, until Wonder Woman makes her presence. Bruce would then ask who killed the world, and Diana would say that it was him. She would then walk with him inside the cave, explaining that everything went wrong after the incident, and that her and the other 100,000 people in the cave have been trying to survive ever since. Bruce then asks how it happened. How did the villains win? But Diana tells Bruce that it wasn't the villains, it was the whole world. Everyone had chosen Doom. And it all started after Lex Luthor made a case to the world to basically choose Doom because the world was ending and what better way to end it than create chaos. Superman tried to stop him, but it didn't work and the rest of the world fell. The original Batman thought that he could unite everyone by opening the doors to the Hall of Justice and try to create a unity. But doing this, he was killed before anything could happen along with several other heroes. Then out of the chaos came the villain Omega who rose up and ruled with an iron fist over Gotham. He he was the worst villain yet, somehow managing to kill Darkseid and several heroes even figuring out the anti-life equation and used it on the world. Heroes and villains tried to stop him, but it never worked due to his immense amount of power. So everyone went underground and Alfred activated a machine that would create an entirely new copy of Batman. A machine Bruce had made so that every generation would have a Batman. After Diana's explanation, Bruce would then say that there are rumors that Clark may still be alive at the Fortress of Solitude, although the possibility is less than likely. But that if he was, the fight could change. But Diana doesn't believe anymore, saying that she made a deal with Hades to allow passage to the underworld and to bring everyone there due to Earth being no longer safe. Bruce would try to fight the idea, but Diana's decision had been made. So the next day, Bruce takes some equipment like his old batsuit and leaves to the fortress to find Clark. 
We start in Joe Chill's apartment where Chill seems to be looking for a gun, while Batman tells him that he removed most of the guns in the house. Batman then attacks Chill, slamming him into the oven, demanding to know about the dead boy in Crime Alley and the chalk outlines. He even says that the boy was his due to a DNA analysis. However, Joe Chill doesn't listen, saying it's the end of an era, and that everything is gonna burn to the goddamned ground. Bruce then wakes up to the Joker attempting a knock-knock joke, but it's quickly interrupted by a speed force storm, and along with this Joker desperately asks Batman to be Robin. Batman yells at Joker saying he would sooner make the damn horse Robin before him, right as the horse is taken from the Speed Force storm. As a voice can be heard within the storm screaming, please help us Bruce. We see that inside the storm it is Bart Allen, Barry Allen, Wally West, and Jake Eric. But Bruce can't do anything else but press on. We then switch over to Alfred back where the story started, shutting down parts of the city until he runs into Scarecrow and Bane. They had both been sent by Omega to bring him to Gotham, but Alfred tries his best to gun them down, leading Scarecrow to end up infecting Alfred with his fear toxin. Omega then emerges from the shadows, telling Alfred that he has something to tell him, saying to Alfred infected with the toxin that he did it. He saved the Waynes. He convinced them not to see the movie, letting Alfred die in peace. Two weeks later, Batman finally reaches the Fortress of Solitude, with Joker repeatedly asking if he can be Robin over and over, to which Batman screams that he'll never be Robin because Robin was a good person. But while he argues with Joker, Superman rockets come flying down from the sky, with one sending Batman flying into several different pillars until he falls near Superman, with Superman picking him up, telling him that he's made it. Clark ends up taking Bruce further into the fortress, leading him to a place that almost looks exactly like the Kent farm. And upon further exploration, Batman is left completely confused due to the way that Superman is acting almost robotic-like. Along with this, a disheveled Lex Luthor makes his presence known while also telling Batman that Superman is long dead and that this was just a robot Superman. Luthor immediately tells Batman to follow him to show Batman an experiment he's been running for some time, involving wormholes that could quite possibly bring a baby Clark Kent from a different world into theirs using Brainiac tech. But while Luthor explains frantically, Batman demands to know what he did to Superman and the world. Luthor then snaps out of it and begins to tell the tale of how he ruined the world just by a simple contest between him and the Man of Steel. The contest would be life or death between the two, involving a vote casted by the whole world. They would come back to the same place days later and stand above kryptonite spikes activated by thought. If the world voted for justice, Superman would prevail, and if the world voted doom, Superman would die. So the two spread the contest to the world, and the two both gave the best speeches they could until the day finally came for judgment. Everything had looked like it was going to go into Superman's favor, but when the kryptonite shards started to rise from the ground, the two shared one last look with each other before the world chose to kill Superman over Lex Luthor inadvertently killing themselves too in the process. Luther would try to explain that he's been sending Clark over and over from different dimensions, but each time he turns up, he's found dead, almost as if it's a sign there's no saving this world. But they're soon interrupted as the Superman robot is hacked, turning on the two of them. And to top it all off, Omega tracked Batman down to the Fortress of Solitude, sending his lackeys to kill him. But before they could get the chance to kill him, Wonder Woman would appear just in time to save Batman. However, they wouldn't be in the clear just yet due to the villains hacking all of Luthor's reserved Superman bots in hopes to kill them. With all seeming lost, Luthor would choose to sacrifice himself in hopes to save the two of them, giving them a fighting chance and to hopefully tell Superman of his heroism someday. They would soon be both transported next to the Spectre's cloak, and Wonder Woman would guide Batman through the cloak's gateway. While in this gateway, way they would develop a plan to get to Gotham and to try and gather forces to take down Omega. But while they discuss why Diana came back and is willing to follow Batman, Batman looks over his shoulder to see everyone that fell when the world ended. And one of the people he sees turns out to be Alfred, filling Bruce with much sadness due to him only just leaving him weeks prior. After this, they end up in Gotham City determined to get through Omega's defenses and stop him for good. However, while sneaking through Gotham, they both run into the Court of Owls and at first it seemed like a fight would break out with each of them calling out who 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 and sentencing the both of them to death. Instead, one of the Talons breaks up the fight, removing his mask, and it turns out to be Dick Grayson. We open with Jim Gordon and Batman on top of the GCPD building, installing a new bat signal, while Batman discusses the details of the chalk outline case and the dead boy, devising how it all connects. Gordon questions about how the boy died, and in Batman's words, he says that the boy died during a botched surgery, 
from a drunken surgeon, and the surgeon in question was Thomas Wayne. With Gordon adding that the Wayne murders were a possible revenge because of the death of Joe Chill's son, Batman realizing this, he starts to lose faith in his crusade. But Gordon seeing this, he motivates Batman, telling him that his new bat signal will be symbolic of his renewed faith, asking Batman to help him start up the new bat signal and let it shine brighter stronger than the last. We then switch back to present day where everyone rebelling is hiding in the Batcave now, referred to as the Owl Cave, where they are all able to hide from Omega's anti-life frequency so they don't become controlled by Omega thanks to Tim Drake. Batman tries to discuss ways that they can defeat Omega, but Dick Grayson and the others are against it because by the time Batman arrived, they already tried to fight and they lost. And now Omega will release a new form of the anti-life frequency so powerful that it can control everyone in the world. Batman tries to rally up some of the members members to fight along his side, but everyone has pretty much accepted their fates. Batman has even shown the people that have died for this war, and Batman seeing this will not stand for it. He just can't let it end this way. So Batman then makes a speech to everyone in the cave, telling them that he is young and idealistic, and he's never even faced the hardships this world has faced, but he still stands strong, and that's the kind of Batman they need. With Batman telling them that Omega is using his anti-life machine in Wayne Tower, so that means he can use his DNA to get into the building and stop the signal, while Diana leads a squad to Arkham Asylum where they're using the amplifier to destroy it, telling everyone that this plan could work because Omega thinks he's already won. And with that, everyone decides that it's better to go out swinging than to do nothing at all. Meanwhile, at Wayne Tower, Omega has started to prep his anti-life emitter, telling his lackeys that Gotham is all but a lie. And that's all it's ever been. But today, it all changes. Hours later, Diana's crew managed to sneak into Arkham Asylum wearing inhibitors that dampen the vision of those affected by the anti-life signal, allowing them to appear invisible. Meanwhile, Batman and Joker, now in a Robin mech suit, sneak into Wayne Tower. Diana's crew sneak through all of Omega's forces right up to where the anti-life amplifier is held, ready to unlock the vault with Riddler's tech, while Bruce enters the tower to a room that's designed almost like Bruce's Batcave. Meanwhile, Diana's crew managed to finally crack the door open, leaving everyone in disbelief because the whole time the amplifier turned out to be Martian Manhunter. But upon Diana reaching out to Martian Manhunter trying to save him, his mind has been completely altered with the intent to kill Diana, locking her inside with him. Back to Batman and Joker, they browse through the room looking at each and every one of the mementos of the people this Omega has killed, and Batman asks Joker what could have happened to this man to make him this way. Right as they both get hit with tech meant to immobilize them, rendering them both defenseless, just as Omega leaves the shadows, introducing himself to Bruce. Later bringing him to a torture chamber, Omega remarks that he's a spinning image of the young Bruce Wayne two of a kind, no scars, no nothing, a clean slate, and one that he can rewrite to his own image, using the repurposed Mobius chair to rewrite Bruce's mind to make Bruce do his bidding. Joker tries to attack Omega by surprise after breaking free, but he would stand no chance against Omega. Afterwards, Bruce would say that he's no Batman at all, and the real Bruce Wayne would be appalled of what this version of him has become. But Omega begs to differ, removing his mask, revealing that Omega was in fact the real Bruce Wayne the entire time. The younger Bruce yells that he will stop him, but Omega just tells Bruce that everything he did let him exactly exactly where he wanted him to be, saying that once the chair has done its work, all of Omega's mind will be transferred to his head and his plan will be complete. Omega would later leave to enact his plan while Bruce would feel defeated, until Joker finally remembered what he did to Batman so long ago, telling Bruce that he made a case for him, that everything about the case involving the chalk outlines, Joe Chill, the dead boy in the alley, and the story about Thomas Wayne's botched surgery was all made up by the Joker to be his last case of the world's greatest detective. And even after Batman never solved the case believing his father killed a young boy, he didn't change, and he still kept his faith in people, enough to try and save the world when it didn't want saving. But the man upstairs calling himself Batman is not Batman, telling Bruce that he is the real Batman. And with that, Bruce would spit out the penny Alfred gave him in the beginning of the story and break out of the chair. Back to Diana's squad, they desperately try to survive Batman's deadliest villains locked inside with them, while Omega gives the go-ahead to kill them all. But while doing so, Batman would sneak up to Omega, ready for the final showdown. The two Batman instantly run towards each other, locking fists, with Omega telling Bruce that he never forgot what the people he tried to help really did to him, as they cheered when his bones broke, or how a little little girl tried to light him on fire six times before it finally worked, as he throws fist after fist trying to convince Batman to change sides. But after fighting and realize he'll never back down, Omega would grab the pike with Darkseid's head above and stab Batman, telling him he'll be a symbol of everything that has to die for a new world to be born, as he activates the anti-life emitter. Back to Diana's squad, Duke Thomas and Dick Grayson fall to Scarecrow's fear toxin, and time is running short to stop Omega. Diana lays broken as Martian Manhunter amplifies amplifies the anti-life equation to the world, as Omega rejoices that a new world is now born, 
One without anger, sadness, and pain. But one that's finally quiet before getting bonked on the head. Diana tries desperately to stop Martian Manhunter as Batman has gone his second wind ready to fight Omega one last time. With Omega trying to tell Batman that the world will just rip itself apart in the end and that they will need someone to obey. But Batman would say that if they choose to listen and follow, they will, and if they don't, they don't. Batman isn't special or someone to obey. He's just another bat among a storm of bats, but that's what makes him special. That's all Batman is, and all he'll ever be, as he stabs Omega in the throat. Omega, with his dying words, would try to tell Batman that he did this all for him, for the world. But Batman would say to Omega that he said he planned all of this, but that's not true. That would have, despite it all, he still saw something in this world. So we held the door open one last time. As Omega looks down at the city he fought so hard to control, fade away, and the nightmare finally over. After the fallout of Omega's reign, things started to shift back into place, but evil still finds a way to rear its ugly head. And Batman would finally close the Chalkline investigation, putting a final X on the spot, getting ready to expect trouble. The Bat family all prepare for what's to come, and Batman watches as a portal opens. A rocket then shoots out from the portal like a bullet from a gun filled with limitless possibilities landing in front of them, crashing down, leaving the entire family speechless as the cockpit door would wind open for the Bat family to see a perfectly healthy, piercing blue-eyed baby. As everyone would gather around to witness the dawn of a new age for this world that went through hell and back. An age of hope. The story at first seems to tackle the idea that Batman as a character is about death and the loss of hope, but by the end it's almost as if Snyder himself decided that Batman as a character needed to change how we viewed the tragedy of his parents' death. Not as a cruel act, but as a starting gun firing to start the race of life, and for Batman to shine through the darkness as a hero for ones to look up to. And I think that writer Scott Snyder is incredibly faithful to this idea, as this was kind of his last hurrah to the character, showing that even in our darkest of moments, even a little crack of light can lift us from the darkness. For those wondering where the Red Hood video is, um, I've been working on that for months, and I've been pissing in jars. So, it'll be out soon. <laughs>